Now, where does inflammation like to go? So inflammation likes to go to four places. I like to use a lot of analogies in my book. My book is full of analogies. I talk about analogies all the time because I want to take complex ideas and make them very simple. So in New Mexico, where I'm from, in Albuquerque, we have these wonderful southwestern homes, and they're flat roofs. So I always tell my patient, your body's a flat roof, and the rain is inflammation, okay? And these flat roofs, they don't drain well. So when we think of trauma, trauma is injury. So if you've had an injury, it could be yesterday, it could have been 50 years ago. Maybe you played football in college, maybe you got a car accident 20 years ago. It doesn't matter what that accident or injury is. Once that tissue is damaged, on a microcellular level, there's still a little bit of inflammation there. It's like a kitchen pilot light on your stove. It stays on, but it's not hot. But if there's any pro-inflammatory fuel that comes in, that kitchen pilot light will light onto a fire again. So when someone has a knee and they injured it 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago in an accident or injury, for example, and then now they come to my office and go, oh, what's wrong? Oh, I have arthritis in my knees. What's, what? Oh, I had, a, I had a college football injury. When was that? 50 years ago. Okay. So why is it hurt now? Well, I have arthritis. Why do you have arthritis? Well, because I'm old. I'm getting older. It's a disease of aging. I go, no, arthritis is not a disease of aging. It's inflammation to the knee joint over time of some pro-inflammatory trigger that keeps lighting up that spot. So we have to look at all these conditions are not, they're lifestyle induced. They have initial trauma, but the idea is that once there's a trauma, if it rains, that place is more likely to have the, the, the inflammation go there. Pathology means disease. So if someone already has a disease process, for example, like a tumor or a lump or a bump or degeneration, that's like the tree falling on your roof. The rain is going to immediately go there. Third place is overuse. Overuse is thinking of like, you know, repetitive motion. So people that work at the checkout or people are working uh, construction or somebody who's even typing the transcript person who's going to record this lecture, they're going to have some inflammation of their wrists, okay, typing all these words. But overuse triggers inflammation. Now, exercise is good. We need exercise. And for those people who haven't watched The Game Changers, that's a movie I'd recommend, The Game Changers. But why professional athletes are moving towards a plant-based diet, because it's all about inflammation, right? When you work out and you exercise, you induce an inflammatory response, and that's why you're a little bit sore when you exercise. That's a good thing. You're actually building muscle. You're building, you know, kind of the strength of the body. However, too much pro-inflammatory foods that most people eat make them sore, and then their sore is inhibiting their recovery, and the recovery then inhibits them how long they can train. So when people move plant-based, for example, then they recover faster because they're less inflamed, and then they train more, than therefore they're a better athlete. So overuse is one place. And then places where your immune system's not paying attention. So that's when we look at the importance of the immune system, looking at vitamin D levels, looking at natural killer cell functioning, and this is the certain things that we can see with inflammation. There are seven or more categories here. Uh, in my book, I go through each one in detail, but I'm gonna stick to the middle one today, which is the standard American diet, okay? Smoking, solar radiation, alcohol, infections, uh, environmental pollution, and stress. Stress is a big one. If I have time, I'll talk about that, but let's start off with the diet. Now, I have 10 steps in my book. These are the steps that after 20 years of practice integratively that we've looked at what can we give our patients that will affect their epigenetics. So this is evidence-based. So if people do what we say in the book, 80%, I can say that off the hand because this is what we get, 80% of every condition will get better. Why is it not 100%, Dr. Pi people will ask me? It's because now we have to look at individualizing, and I'll talk about how do we individualize the diet, how do we individualize nutrients, how do we in individualize everybody's microbiome and system of functioning. So let's look at what are we eating in the standard American right diet right now. So the average American eats per day, this is per day, one pound of animal protein, beef, chicken, eggs, pork, or fish. One pound. Two pounds of cheese and dairy products a day. Half a pound of refined flour. All you can eat breadsticks, footlong subway sandwiches, a pound of vegetables, but that's in the form of french fries. And, and here's the interesting thing. You know, the government now, because it's such a big thing now in some of the guidelines now, ketchup is now the second most consumed vegetable now in the diet. And then consuming about 18 ounces of soda a day per person, a third of a pound of GMO sugar and high fructose corn syrup uh, sweeteners, and an ounce of artificial sweeteners like the pink and blue and yellow packets. My book will go into the detail of each of these things and why there are problems. Now, this has led to this increase of inflammation, so let me explain. In 1950 to 1960, you know, we all know that omega-3s, everybody hears about omega-3s, we've been talking about it on the panel, you'll hear it all week, omega-3s, right, flax, chia, hemp, walnuts, you know, some of the seeds, 
Uh, some people take fish, which we're not recommending. But these are all the omega-3s, right, that help with lowering inflammation. These are omega fatty acids. These have an anti-inflammatory effect, a cardiovascular protective effect, helps with the joints, and the DHA helps the brain. Now, in 1950, 1960, there was a, a ratio, which was about 1 to 1, depending on the literature, or 2 to 1, depending on the literature that you read. 2 to 1 means that we ate the animal protein, but we ate it rarely, okay? It was like Sunday. It was after church. You know, dad got a raise, grandma came over, it was a holiday, it was a celebration. So we feasted, we had a roast, we had a steak, we had, you know, all this kind of food, but then the rest of the week we famined. Why? Because it was expensive. We couldn't eat this every day, right? But what happens is that as food production goes up and products of food goes down in terms of price, the average person by 2012 was eating about 40 times more omega-6s to one omega-3 in their diet. And in some parts of the worst part of the country, which we call the stroke belt, it's actually a map that's called the stroke belt. They actually have a 70 to 1 ratio. So they even fry the green tomatoes in those areas. Now, why did we get there? Because food is so cheap. Food is cheaper than it's ever been in the entire history of the planet, right? Dollar menu, jumbo deals, boxes. You know, in my state, we're the 40th poorest state in the country, unfortunately. So when people say, oh, the economy's doing good, no, it's not, is that you know, unemployment is not doing better, it's that more people are working two to three jobs. Right? So when a family of four in my state makes about $40,000 on average, a bucket of chicken for $20 with sides goes a long way. But what happens is by pushing people to eat cheaper foods due to this economy that we have and other constraints of what's happening here, this is this vicious cycle where we're now stuck eating more pro-inflammatory foods more than we ever did. In fact, when I was a kid, you know, when my family used to take us, you know, we actually used to go get a bucket of chicken, it was on 4th of July. It was the Super Bowl. You know, it was expensive when I was a kid. But now it's super cheap. And so people go and eat this food every day because every day is game day in America. There's a game every day on some channel. So this kind of drives us, circular aspect. Now, the other thing is that, you know, to hopefully get you a little bit more into political activism, is that 11 of the top insurance companies, and my book goes through all sorts of politics of food and, and food industry and health industries, how they're, how they're kind of in bed with each other. But 11 of the top insurance companies own about $2 billion of stock in the top five fast food companies. So that should make you angry, because that means, that means they're, they're having you buy cheap food that makes you sick, that makes you then have to pay more of a premium and more of a copay and more of a deductible, and now you have a pre-existing condition, which now they charge you more of these, right? So this, there's, there's no health in healthcare anymore. We have to be looking at how can we look at changing the system. 